And then when I met Evie Hayes, uh, she became a manager, mentor, teacher and stuff. And then she introduced me to John Young and Kevin Lewis. Um, I did John's television shows. He had lots of different shows, a morning show with cartoons. And I would host that with him and, and that sort of thing. And then the guys, I remember my dad was there. They were all talking about, well, it'd be great to use John's talent and it would be great to use Jamie's talent. Um, in, in some concept. What what could we do? And my dad said, well, Brian and the Juniors was on for 20 odd years and produced lots of amazing kids and we've got the phone numbers of all the other kids. Mm. What about something like that? But John would be the singer host rather than just the host and Jamie would be the first kid. Mm. And that's how it all basically came about. Wow. And of course, Young Talent Time went on for so many years and, and uh, I was actually stunned that you were there for only really, as I understand, about 10 months uh, all up on that show, and yet it felt like, in a good way, for much, much longer than that. And, and you certainly packed a lot into that time. I did, yeah. It, it's, it, I remember, you know, even when I came home from America, and I remember looking back and realising it had only been 10 months, and yet yet it was so impactive, obviously on the audiences, but on me as well. Mm. And, you know, thank God. But then... Like now, people say, wow, you were only on it for 10 months, but it, it, it seemed as though you were on it for such a long time. But I guess uh, my success was was so crazy that, you know, they would always invite me on. I would be doing guest spots. My brother, Derek, became a young talent time person not long yeah. afterwards, and he stayed with the show for a lot of years. He was one of their big heartthrobs. So, you know, and I guess that also was something I was doing very well. I became king of pop. I was touring everywhere, the highest paid entertainer. So that all, I guess, reflected back on the fact that people then associated me with YCT. For, for them, it was like it was a big Australian phenomenon television show. Yes. And, and, and for me to be that first success story. Um, it, it just anchored me into that show. It's like nowadays, you know, I've got, I started my own television show um, on Foxtel and Channel 31 mm -hmm. called Jamie Redfern Super Kids. And I had my Redfern's Rascals, which was a big group of kids that sang with me and on their own. And uh, the Great Southern Voices, which were kids that I would introduce um, more, more like teenage and up. Uh, and they were just the great singers that I'd met in my talent quest and things that I would stage at big, all the big major shopping centres around Australia. That became a really good show on Foxtel, rated really, really well for about eight years. And looking at doing something like that again in the future, to be honest, it would be great. It seems like it, it's, a, it's a formula that, that just works, and yet it, it, more than a formula, there is always that need to showcase work, uh, to, to highlight this fabulous new talent. Is that how you see it? I think so, yeah. Uh, you know, you, you, you've got all the bigger shows, all the um, Australia's Got Talent and the Aussie Idol and all mm. of those shows, whatever. But I think something, especially with what we did, we, we kind of, it was a very, there was a no-budget show, the Super Kids. It mm. rated really well. It was very good. but And it, and it happened for its time. It was, it was successful. But nowadays with this COVID thing, I think people coming back to basics and just wanting, you know, things to be a little more simple, um, they want to reminisce a little bit. They don't want it to be so glitz and glam, I don't think. And and so when I posted a lot of my videos, just for fun, because people were looking to be entertained, they said, have you got anything during this COVID lockdown thing that mm. we can you know, be entertained by? So I started editing the old videos, putting them on uh, Facebook with some stories about how I met the kids or what happened during a certain taping session or whatever. People just really enjoyed it, actually. And they started saying, wow, it would be great for you to do something like this again. Um, and, and it, you know, then joining with uh, No Kid Hungry Are You, it kind of, I looked at that and I thought, well, I've got my characters that I'd like to introduce. Mm. Uh, yeah, it would be good to introduce kids again and sing some stuff with them and before I get too much older. So it is an idea that we're toying with very seriously. Oh, that's great. And I must admit, it, it just seemed to be like this incredible dizzy time for you and as you as you alluded to before i mean 71 you a crown king of pop for the best newcomer it was only a few years later that you you got that award again but as as a king of pop um but yeah. you know as a teenager it must have been just both amazing and overwhelming and i mean you've got the girls screaming at you fan mail coming in it must have been somewhat kind of breathtaking surely oh, it was it was i mean it was you know, things like two hundred thousand people to see me at certain open-air venues um, I remember my daughter seeing something 
with ACDC where there was 150,000 people in the crowd mm. at Donington Castle and my daughters who knew. They said, well, we see people come up to Dad all the time. But I remember they were Akadaka fans like I was. I'm watching this concert on DVD. And I remember them turning to me, one of them, and saying, hey, Dad, I know you were huge, but you, did you ever get crowds as big as that mm. to see you? And my, and my wife at the time said, imagine 50,000 more people than that. <laughs> and that's what. And, and they went, what? Their mouths just dropped. <laughs> you know, but it's things like if there was something on uh, the internet in Americans, I think it was, or, or pretty much Americans, primarily fighting with Aussie fans about Justin Bieber at one point because he'd appeared at Roseland's shopping centre in Sydney and he got 5,000 people. And they were saying how incredible it was and nobody could ever do that because it was such a big crowd. Yeah. And then a number of my fans jumped in and said, hey, hold on. Jamie Redfern, who was one of our singers many years ago, when our population was like a quarter or whatever of what it is today, mm. got 25, 25,000 people <laughs> yes. at that same shopping centre, which was true. And oh, the glass was breaking, escalators were breaking. It was just crazy. Yeah. They called it Jamie Mania at the time after Beatlemania <laughs> because I was from Liverpool. So they said, well, Liverpoolian, Jamie Mania, Beatlemania, Jamie Mania. And that, that, that term came about back then too, which was a bit of fun, yeah. to be honest. But yeah, some weird and wild wonderful stuff that happened it was just crazy times and of course to add into that the whole uh, experience around with Liberace and and the amazing people that you met I mean they were just international stars that you're hanging out with the, the likes of Elvis and and Jack Benny I mean and the whole list of people that went on Michael Jackson yeah, yeah. with Michael Jackson and, and, and always especially in Vegas you know Liberace telling me to check out who was in the venue. Just look through the curtain and see. They're here to see you. They've all been to see me. Yes. So now they're coming to see you. And I said, why? He said, well, you're regarded as the best performer in the world, the best singer, child singer who ever lived. And I said, what? And Elvis Presley, Sammy Davis Jr., Ginger Rogers, Rock Hudson. I mean, so many people were calling me that. Mm. And it, it, it's amazing stuff, really. You know, even even me, I kind of look back on it and think, wow, did that really happen? <laughs> but, it, but it did. It did indeed. Can we take a break? And, uh, Jamie, if you'll stay with us, uh, we'd love to uh, keep having a bit more of a chat with you. Would that be okay? That'd be fine. It'd be terrific, yeah. Jamie Redfern, our special guest, right here on Talking Queensland. And Jamie Redfern is my special guest. This is Talking Queensland. Well, Jamie, uh, you're well known for a lot of songs, and I guess Hit Your Ride and a Smile is certainly one that was extremely good for you. Did you get to select the songs that you worked with, or how did that work? No, that was one of my big issues because I was primarily a rock and roll singer. And so to have my clothing selected for me, chosen mm. for me, and, and I'm telling you, Ash, I mean, this, the, a lot of that gear I would never be caught dead <laughs> wearing. You know, I'll never choose to wear that stuff. You know, you just don't choose to wear stuff like that when you're a you know young fella. That's my dog walking in the background. Can you hear him? No, that's that's Benny. <laughs> that's yeah, he's synonymous with my radio show. I've got an online radio show. Right. And uh, yeah, the radio KSA on Friday nights, and he he's always in the background because I'm doing it from home. <laughs> I think that's all part of our COVID world, Jamie. <laughs> exactly, it's called the Benny and Jamie show now. Sort of thing. But anyway, uh, what, what was I talking about? I so we're talking about hitch a ride and a smile, and, and uh, selecting your own songs. Oh yeah, selecting the songs. No, the songs were all chosen for me, um, and I not that I minded. You know, really, the songs are great songs, and. But at the same time, as I said, not songs necessarily that I would have sung. I think Hitch a Ride was one, obviously, a little more poppy and rocky. That was kind of uh, leaning towards what I would have selected for myself. Hmm. Well, we'll take a listen to that track and be back in a moment. Okay. was Hitch a Ride and a Smile. Uh, and Jamie, you, you took this song into the finals of the World Popular Song Festival in Tokyo. You topped it off yep. then in 1974 as King of Pop, and that was an amazing award. Still remember that on the cover of TV Week. Remember those <laughs> days? Yeah, uh, yeah. And, of course, it's all the buzz of, of those heady days that came to a very abrupt end, though, with deals over contracts and recordings. Uh, what really took place at that time for you, and, and what happened at that stage? Um, just dirty politics. It was show business politics. You know, mm. there are things that um, 
things that were good. I mean, it, it, I guess you would call it, it sounds awful, but child exploitation. You know, mm. there, there was, my dad would stand in and say, no, you can't do that. We're not signing this. We're not signing that. And we were warned uh, effectively that, okay, if you don't, then your career will be dead in the water. Bang. Mm. And even in history, um, you know, things will be changed in the history of everything, every success that you've had. Um, it'll be made to look lesser than it was. And, and, and that saddens me that people are able to do that. They did talk to me um, a number of years later. Somebody came to me uh, who was a representative of, of, you know, the powers that be in mm. show business and, and said to me that if I denied my dad and left my dad, had nothing to do with him, then I would be welcomed back into the industry and I would resume um, wow. a very high and successful position in the industry. And I uh, look, in those days, um, I was there. I still am very much. My dad's no longer with us. But there was no way that I was ever going to deny my dad. He did nothing wrong and he supported me and was hmm. probably the biggest reason that I was a success was because he and mum put in the hard yards and he was the one that travelled with me, you know. And how did you deal, you know, like with that whole one day you've got everything, you, you know the story, I mean, all being at, not seventeen, eighteen, but you, you know the story yeah. that's going on, and then all of a sudden there's kind of nothing there. You're in a sense kind of out in the cold. That must have been incredibly difficult to process and to work through. It was, it was, and you know I did a, a television show, Burke's Backyard. Remember when that was on? Yes. And, uh, yeah, it was very well well received. They actually gave me rather than the eight minute time slot they usually did, they gave gave me thirteen to fifteen minutes. And mm. Don said it was so interesting, but he, I remember him telling me, saying to me. You know, a hell of a lot of uh, kids who were super successful, as you were, um, and then things were taken away from them for whatever reason, turned to drugs, turned to drink, and a lot of them committed suicide, did mm. those types of things. And he said, it's amazing that you stand up so strong and, and, and you seem happy. And I said, well, yeah, a lot of that is my Christian faith. I've always been a, a great believer in God, mm. in Jesus. I know some people find that a bit strange, but instinctively... Since I was a little kid, I've always believed and felt that that is all 100% true, and nothing that I've ever seen has ever, you know, changed my mind on that. And I don't think ever could now. Mm. Um, it's too firmly established in me. But I think my faith and also great family support, my family, mum, dad, and my brothers and sisters, always um, they were always very real and very supportive. Um, and, yeah, I remember my dad saying at one point, why, Jim, he, he got very upset not long before he died, and he said, did I do anything wrong? He said, because you were so rich, no. um, so well off, many, many millions of dollars. And he said that was taken from you, basically. And he said, you know, you could have owned half of Melbourne, half of the world. And he said, you know, did I do something wrong? Because if I see you struggling to pay a bill from time to time, it really kills me. No. And I said, no, it, got, it, it upset me a lot because I said, Dad, you did everything right. And other people, unscrupulous people, did the wrong thing by me. It had nothing to do with you. You did everything right, which helped him and we had a hug and whatever. But yeah, time, it's, I think you either sink or swim. Yes. You've got to have the mentality of sink or swim. And I'm a swimmer. I just, I just kick on. I don't believe in giving up. And I'm not saying I don't have my odd moments where I get depressed, I get a little flat. That can happen. And, but generally that's in times where, you know, you're not having a good day. A couple of things have not gone your way. And it gets you a touch. And, so, and, and you, you know, basically what I say to myself, actually, is, yeah, just allow yourself that for a little while. Just, just allow yourself that, sure. but not for too long. Yeah. And then kick out of it and get on. Kick yourself up the backside and say, come on, mate, you're better than that. Well, that's and that's, that's, how, that's how I've always, always been. And you've got some, some great dreams still to come. And uh, it's been an absolute delight to talk with you, Jamie. Of course, uh, YTT, 50 years next year. Uh, which I find just amazing. <laughs> that amazing. time is gone. Yeah, and my look, I'll say this: my blessings in my life always will be my daughters. Yes. You know, somebody said, um, you know, I've got a beautiful girlfriend right now, and and life's looking really great. I get on very well with my ex-wife, really, really well. She's a good girl too. Uh, but my daughters are my blessing. My family are my blessing. Um, the fans that I have have always been amazing. Absolutely beautiful people. I don't know why. I, my my mum even used to say that. I don't know why I've been blessed with such great <laughs> people as fans, but I have. I yeah. have. Well, now wonderful. God's good. God is good. That is wonderful, Jamie. Lovely to talk with you. Hope we might be able it's to catch up next year with the celebration of YTT. Uh, it'd be great to have you on the show again. Fantastic. I look forward to that. This is Talking Queensland.